Hello and welcome to the Sunshine Cathedral. The Sunshine Cathedral is a different kind of church where the past is past and the future has infinite possibilities. And with that, we invite you to come and worship with us here on Sunday mornings at 9 and 1030 a.m. at 1480 Southwest 9th Avenue. Now, I invite you to come in and worship with us here at the Sunshine Cathedral. Our first reading is from the book of Exodus. Then Moses went up on the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. Divine glory rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, God called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud and the divine glory appeared to the Israelites like devouring fire on the top of the mountain. Moses entered into the midst of the cloud and went up the mountain and Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and nights. In these human words, God's voice is heard. God is with you. And also with you. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. You, Six days later, Jesus chose Peter, James, and his brother John to accompany him high up on the hillside where they were quite alone. There, his whole appearance changed before their eyes, his face shining like the sun and his clothes as white as light. Then Moses and Elijah were seen talking to Jesus. Teacher, Peter exclaimed, it is wonderful for us to be here. If you like, I could put up three shelters, one each for you and Moses and Elijah. But while he was still talking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my dearly loved chosen one, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When they heard this voice, the disciples fell on their faces, overcome with fear. Then Jesus came up to them and touched them. Get up and don't be frightened, he said. And as they raised their eyes, there was no one to be seen but Jesus himself. This is the gospel, the good news. All right, how many, it was quite a lot at the first service, how many people remember altar rails or, or, or the, the little kneeling rails at the front of the Quite a few more at the 9 o'clock service, I must confess. Oh, now everyone, okay. The, um, <laughs> it was like a fence, right? It was like this little gate. And um, it was for communion. You would come forward if you were Methodist or Episcopal or lots of other things. And you would come forward, not, not if you were Baptist or Assembly of God. They had like these little sofas down there, but that was for something else. That was for, you know, coming and that was a conversion thing. And, and uh, that was the, uh, the mourner's bench, I think they called it. But no, this was, this was like a fence. This was like a gate. Don't fence me. This was a fence. And you would come forward in communion time and you would kneel. And then here comes the, the bread and the cup and, and all of that. Well, it looked like just part of church architecture. It looked beautiful, it looked normal. It's, you know, we, we went there every Sunday and we kneel and receive the, the communion. I assume that's the way Jesus had initiated it. You know, at the Last Supper, he had a little fence, had people sit down, he served that way. And, um, and that there was like some, you know, like some deeply theological purpose. You know, we were kneeling in the, in the presence of the sacred and it was all very full of awe and reverence. And so, I was shocked and stunned and, and very surprised to learn that originally that thing that looks like a fence was a fence. That uh, in, in old time, and way back when, um, when, church, when most people lived in rural areas and where ch churches were just open, the windows would open, the doors would open, that, and, and animals would roam about, that you might come to church and find not only the people in their assigned seats, but you might find some chickens and a goat wandering about. And, uh, I mean, we've got our own menagerie here with, with, with Calvin and Sunshine, and, but it, <laughs> you might have more in the old days, right? And so, uh, and the thing about, about livestock ro roaming about is that not only, they like to sniff things and they like to taste things. And so when you've got bread and, and wine, you don't want them, you know, uh, it, it just makes it less fun for everyone else. So up comes the fence and uh, to, to keep everyone out. And then long after that was no longer needed for that, we kept eventually, uh, as, as new modern churches uh, were, were being designed, that was just in the way and, and, and you don't see much of that anymore in newer churches. Well, that reminds me, of an old story about a devout rabbi who spent three hours every day in study and prayer. He would study the Talmud, he would study the Torah, and, and he would say his prayers three hours every day. But he also, as many of us do, had a cat. 
Well, cats don't care how disciplined or pious you are. They don't care anything about but themselves. I want to be fed, I want to be scratched, I want to be played with, I want to be left alone. They are the center of the universe. And so here's the cat, while the rabbi is trying to study, trying to pray, here comes the cat to sit in his lap. Here comes the cat to do that cat headbutt thing that they do uh, on his leg. Here comes the cat rubbing against him. Here comes the cat, you know, walking across his desk with his, the tail, flicking him in the nose. And then if he does scratch him, there goes the hiney up in the air like they do. Um, <laughs> Well, it's anno- you know, it breaks the mood, you know, of, of, of trying to be so devout and spiritual and, and learn some stuff and be in communion with it. So the rabbi takes the cat and just puts it outside. And that becomes part of the ritual then, that when it's time for study and prayer, the cat has to go outside. At the end of the three hours, the cat can come back in. Well, the rabbi's son had grew up witnessing this, this, uh, this ritual, and he wanted to continue the tradition of study and prayer and, and being undisturbed. He didn't have three hours a day, though, to give, but he did want to spend one hour a day in study and prayer, and he knew that if he didn't put the cat out, the cat could be a nuisance, so he would start out right away by putting the cat out and then sit down at his desk for study and prayer. Well, the rabbi's granddaughter, also growing up in this tradition, wanted to keep the tradition alive, and so when she was an adult, every day she would put the cat out. No prayer, no study, just put the cat out. And so the tradition, it, it, while the tradition was being observed, the reason and purpose for it got lost. Do you remember that hateful cotton in aspirin bottles? I know this seems like Pulp Fiction. Here and here and here, it all comes together, and, and you know, trust me. So do you remember that hateful cotton in the aspirin bottles? Anyone? Yes, yes, yes. So how many times have you fought with that demonic, shapeless bit of cotton in a little bitty hole, miles of cotton to get to the seven aspirins in the bottom that you're fine. <laughs> you might even use tweezers. You'd have to find tweezers to, to, to dig out the cotton to get, to get the aspirin so you could have access to this pain-killing, fever-reducing, sometimes life-saving medication. What sadist devised the nefarious plan to stuff an impenetrable wall of cotton between medication and the one in desperate need of it? Well, actually, in the beginning, as all good stories start, in the beginning, the cotton served a purpose. Aspirin was dry and crumbly. And when tablets rattled around in the bottle during shipping, they would break into pieces. So the cotton was meant to hold the tablet steady so one could take aspirin pills rather than aspirin bits. Eventually, Manufacturers learned to coat the aspirins so that, that they didn't break when rattling around the bottle. You could also take them without water, just slide right down your throat. The coated aspirin, uh, it also was supposed to be easier on your stomach. Coated aspirin, all, all the aspirins coated now. And so even though the cotton was no longer needed to keep the aspirin from being pulverized, the companies forever kept stuffing the evil cotton in the bottle of, of indestructible aspirin at this point. So why were they doing it? It's not needed, and it was actually even an added expense. So one executive, uh, an executive of one of the aspirin companies was asked, why, if the, if the cotton was no longer necessary, and it was added expense, why keep doing it? And he said, no real reason, just tradition, I guess. And then eventually, that tradition has become less and less prevalent. Today, in a world of coated tablets and medicinal gummies, cotton wrestling is less and less part of the medicine-taking process. You see, the traditions that we tend to idolize almost always began as practical events. At one time, uh, what was uh, a practical and maybe even ingenious response to a practical need might have been repeated over and over until it became a stylized ritual. But the ritual without the context often becomes empty or superstitious or cumbersome or even silly, like needless cotton in an aspirin bottle, like putting the cat out for prayer time without saying the prayers, like putting a fence up to keep livestock out when there, are, when there is no livestock. The story of the transfiguration, which always pops up at this time of the year as we're going through the cycle of readings. The, 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 right before Lent, we always hear about the transfiguration, and it reminds me 
of the need to let traditions evolve. Not necessarily to just wipe them all out, but to let them, be, because they are organic, to let them be part of a living faith. And living things evolve, they grow, they change. And so to let those traditions continue to evolve so they can continue to be meaningful and continue to be used to meet current needs. We don't want rituals and, and, and practices and sacraments and symbols to point to themselves because then they do become idolatrous or, or at worst useless. We want them always to be pointing forward, pointing beyond themselves, pointing us in a direction of growth and transformation. And that is exactly what the story of transfiguration is. Some scholars believe that this strange story, and I call it a strange story because it's basically a ghost story, right? They go up the mountain and, 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 and for, for some sort of picnic or whatever, and Jesus is favorites. He doesn't take everyone, just a few. And they go up the mountain to have this little picnic, and while they're there, they, there's Moses, who's been dead a long time. And there's Elijah, who's been gone a long time. Not quite dead. We'll hear about that in a minute. But Elijah's been gone a long time, and Moses has been dead a long time, and they're joining the picnic. And so it's kind of a weird little ghost story just in the middle of the gospel, uh, uh, chapter 17 of Matthew, chapter 9 and Mark, just in the middle. And some scholars believe that that strange story wound up in the middle because uh, by accident, that it was actually meant to be a post-Easter narrative, that, that Jesus, it's, it's the resurrected uh, 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 Jesus or, or a... Or Diction of resurrection, and so we see Moses resurrected, we see Elijah resurrected, we see the faithful living on and on, and so it's meant to be sort of a post-Easter uh, narrative, and Mark somehow, uh, as it's being copied and copied and copied, that story gets accidentally put in the middle rather than at the end, and then when Matthew is writing, he's got Mark's gospel in front of him, and so he just puts it in the middle also, just like I saw my dad put the cat out and my grandpa put the cat out, so I just put the cat out, even though it doesn't have the same meaning maybe. But beyond the possible editorial snafu of the Transfiguration story, it's clearly a reworking of a much older narrative. It is an older story that is being reimagined and new characters added. It's a telling of an old story in a new way for a new audience to meet a new need. It is the story and the tradition being allowed to evolve so that it can stay fresh and new and alive. Queer scholars sometimes apply the transfiguration story to transgender realities. Jesus is transfigured, bathed in light so that his friends see more of him see him as he truly is. He seems different, but in reality, he is just more himself. He is, he is understood a little better by some of his loved ones. And isn't that the transgender experience? We learn that a transgendered friend is more than the gender binaries that we try to force on people. And so we let ourselves see them in a new light. We see them more truly as they understand themselves to be, as they really are. They may change their name or how they dress. They may even have surgery. But what they are really doing is becoming more obviously who they've known themselves to be all along. We are simply seeing more of them than we allowed ourselves to see before. It's a transfiguration. And the same analogy can be made to coming out. When someone we thought was straight tells us that they are lesbian or gay or bisexual, they aren't becoming something different. I, I, I haven't heard this in a long time. I think we're finally getting more educated about it. But do you remember when people used to say, talk about people turning gay as if, you know, you turned around? You know, I turned around and then I looked around, ooh, poo, poo, I was gay. Don't, you, no, it turns gay. You are gay or you're not gay. You, just, you discover you are or, or, or you realize that you're not, whatever. But, you know, you're not turned like a pumpkin into a carriage. It, you know, that's not how it works. <laughs> And you're not, and, and P.S., for those, for the discredited Exodus ministries, nobody's turned straight either. You just are what you are, and it's all part of God's rainbow diversity. And, and here's a tip, too. If you can change your sexual orientation, please do, because you've got a strange gift that nobody has. Make the most of it. If you are gay and can be straight, do it right now, because, because forbid you should have such a gift and not use it. And if you can, if you are straight and can be gay, do it right now. If you can change who you are, do it, because that is a rare gift. Don't let it go to waste. But for most of us, <laughs> we just are what we are. In any case, when people come out, they're not becoming something different. They're showing more light. 
They are, they are letting more light be on the truth of who they are. They're showing more of who they really are. They're embracing the message that just as they are, they are God's children with whom God is well pleased. Matthew is shedding new light or more light on Jesus, helping his community think of Jesus uh, in, in new ways, in, in larger ways, and therefore also to think of themselves in new and larger ways. You see, Matthew has been subtly suggesting that Jesus is building on Moses' foundation. He's been doing that throughout the gospel. He's been basically retelling the story of Moses, but casting Jesus as the main character so that the story continues to be our story, relevant for a new age. The story about Moses is really the story of God leading God's people, and we want to think of ourselves as God's people. And so, but unless you're on this Mount of Transfiguration, you're probably not ever going to see Moses. So you have these new stories about God leading God's people into justice and hope and freedom and healing and liberation. And so Matthew has been casting Jesus as as this Moses role throughout his gospel. And we saw that in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. We focused only on chapter 5 throughout February, but in that Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, like Moses the lawgiver giving the commandments, Jesus is on a mountain giving this sermon, this defining, life-changing sermon. And in chapter 7, Matthew's Jesus boils down the commandments of Moses. In fact, he, he boils down the whole of Scripture to just the golden rule. Treat others the way you'd like to be treated. He even adds this. This is the law and the prophets. Treat others the way you'd like to be treated. This is the law and the prophets. The law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets. In other words, this is what the Bible is all about. Basically, just don't be a jerk. Religious zealots with their fiery passion and faux righteous indignation calling for oppressive and discriminatory laws in Africa and Asia and the Caribbean and Russia and the southern and southwestern United States never seem to have the golden rule as their primary guiding sacred text. If you wouldn't want your love demonized, your humanity min minimized, or your rights trivialized, then don't try to do that to others. Moses goes up a mountain to commune with God, to bring, down, to, to bring down the law, and he takes three friends with him, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu. And when Jesus goes up the mountain in today's story, he takes three friends, Peter, James, and John. Did Jesus really take three friends with him? exactly like Moses? Did he really have a mystical experience on a mountain of seeing Moses and, and, and a prophet? Did Moses have these mystical experiences? Who knows? The point isn't to prove what happened in the past. The point is the, is the story of God at work in through and as us in an ongoing story. And so we do well to always retell the story and always place ourselves in the story, keeping it new. How many versions can there be of Dracula, for heaven's sakes? If we can reimagine Dracula a brilliant really times, maybe we can show that much creativity and ingenuity with the gospel. And that's what the gospel writers do with their tradition. When Moses encounters God on the mountain, he enters into a cloud like a devouring fire, the story says. And then in the story of transfiguration, we see this overwhelming bright cloud enveloping them as well. Moses and his companions see God on the mountaintop, and Jesus and his friends hear God on the mountaintop. Again, the parallels are probably too close to be anything other than literary invention, but we are looking for truth, not facts. As the Native American storytellers sometimes say, I'm not sure that it happened exactly this way, but I do know that it's absolutely true. And the truth is that when we go to the mountain, that is when we spend time in communion with the source of life, and especially when we journey in community, that is with friends and neighbors, we find new insights. We find new courage, new hope, new understandings, and we are therefore transformed, and as those who have been transformed, we can help transform our world. Now, Matthew has been having Jesus build on Moses' legacy for a while. And today, not only does Jesus serve as in the Moses role, but Moses actually makes a cameo appearance in the story. And how, how, how uh, common is that now? Someone who's 
starred in the original Broadway production of a thing. When they make a movie of it 30 years later, that person is selling cigarettes in the crowd somewhere, a little, little cameo role. That, and here's, here's Jesus playing the role of Moses, but Moses shows up just for this little cameo appearance. And not just Moses, but Elijah too. Remember, Elijah didn't die, according to the legend. He was taken to God in a whirlwind, and his spirit rested on his disciple Elisha to carry on his work. And so the tradition says that Elijah, having never died, can return one day to help lead the people to liberation. Matthew transforms the returning prophet myth by saying, we don't need to wait for Elijah to come back. He just did. In a mystical, imaginative way, he turned up at the Mount of Transfiguration. He and Moses returned as if to validate Jesus' mission, and Jesus validates the mission of his followers, his disciples, the people who come after him, and we are in that tradition, so Jesus validates our mission. So let's keep working for hope and healing and justice in the world. Let's quit waiting for something, some great, huge, grand cosmic event to happen. Let's just get to work. Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, the liberator and the justice worker, have passed the torch in Matthew's imagination to Jesus. And we, being followers of Jesus, continue to carry that torch. We are the children of God, with whom God is well pleased. That's transfiguration. Once we realize that the light of God is in us and is propelling us forward to do the work that God has called all prophets and priests and, and, and sayers and, and justice workers and healers of the world to do, that's what we are. We are the ones being called to continue that work. And it leads quite naturally into the Lenten journey. Tonight, we'll gather for our annual gospel drag revival with Lady Fancy. If you were planning to go to the Gospel Drag Revival at Calvary Tra Chapel or First Baptist Church, I will ask that you come to ours instead. <laughs> it will be much better. And it's a fun way to gather community and to fund ministry and to let people experience a kind of music that they may not hear much anymore, but, but which brings back fond memories for them, though it will certainly be presented in perhaps a new way. It will be transfigured and presented in a new sort of way for them. It's also a safe way to get some people into a worship space for the first time in a very long time. So do come out tonight. And then on Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, we'll gather again to kick off Lent officially with the Ash Wednesday service. Now on Ash Wednesday, we are reminded of our mortality and of our faith that death is not the end of our significance. It's not the end of our purpose. It's not even the end of our existence we don't know necessarily what is next, but we do know that energy can't be destroyed. It can only change form. So the energy that is our lives must continue, and we trust our faith is that energy is always part and parcel of God. We won't focus on sin and sorrow, on guilt and grief, on shame or blame. We won't tell you to give up chocolate or movies or sodas. In fact, my Lenten discipline is to double the amount of sodas I drink. And then I'll complain to you about how fat I'm getting. That's just how that works. That's just my own psychosis. We will ask you, though, to make Lent a time of growth and renewal, to make Lent a time of transformation and healing, a time not of denial, but of commitment. And then we'll move through our Lenten journey toward Easter. And part of that journey will include enjoying the Yale Whiff and Poofs next Saturday, a Lenten tradition going back several minutes already. Throughout Lent, we'll take the old stories and we may put a new spin on some of them. I'm even going to give you a spoiler alert. We are going to sing and say Alleluia all through Lent. We don't stop praising God just because it's Lent. In fact, the Lenten journeys may be when we need to praise even more. So if you were expecting, oh, I'm sad, we're going to lose our Alleluia song, no, we're going to sing it louder than ever all through Lent. Because we are going to take the old ways. and let them evolve. We will probably apply those old stories in ways that are new for some people, but that's what a living faith does. This is the path to transformation, the path that, that says, allow yourselves to grow, allow yourselves to think in broader terms, allow yourselves to believe that God believes in you, allow yourselves to let faith be bigger and more joyful than it's ever been before. That's the path to transformation, that's the point of transfiguration, and this, is the good news. Amen. 
are you ready for a transfiguring experience, an experience of light, an experience of going to the mountain? And you know the mountain represents God, and you know that God is everywhere. So basically, transfiguration is just paying attention, just letting yourself be who you are, and letting yourselves appreciate all the possibilities that exist. Reminding yourselves that not only are we called to treat others the way we'd like to be treated, but we deserve to be treated with respect and love and dignity. That that's the law and the prophets. That's the whole of Scripture. While we play biblical tit for tat, throwing around this verse and that, trying to wound people, that's not what it's, that's a horrible misuse and horrible misunderstanding of Scripture. The whole point, the larger meta narrative of Scripture is to do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And that is so much easier to do once you believe that God is love and divine love is all inclusive, embracing everyone, leaving no one out. Are you ready for that mountaintop experience? To know that God's love is the source and substance of your life, so you deserve the best, and the very best is possible for you. Jesus, according to the tradition, gathered with friends to share a meal in the midst of difficulty. As if to demonstrate that optimism is always available no matter what is going on, no matter what is happening, no matter how bleak things look. And so gathered with people, he demonstrates that when we gather together, when we share what we have, when we eat a meal, no matter what we are doing, we can experience the presence of God because there's not a spot. For God is not. And so Jesus, after that meal, took a piece of leftover bread and blessed it by giving thanks because gratitude is the best way to bless anyone or anything. And then he broke the bread as if to say, when you were feeling broken, remember there is divine wholeness beyond that experience. He said, take and eat and remember. And then he took Elijah's cup and he blessed it and he offered it to everyone, leaving no one out saying, drink all of this, all of you. This is a cup of a new and everlasting covenant, a covenant that includes all people. And whenever you drink this, remember. Holy One, we give thanks that at this table, you are reminding us of our oneness with you and with one another. And so we give thanks for this, and we allow these simple elements, these simple symbols, to remind us of the profound truth that wherever we are, you are and all is well. Amen. Sunshine Cathedral, we practice an open communion. And what that means is you don't have to be a member of this church or any church to receive the sacrament, just as you are. With whatever your beliefs or doubts may be, you are welcome to participate in this feast of unconditional love. My friends, these are the gifts of God for all the people of God. Hello, I want to thank you for joining us for worship today here at the Sunshine Cathedral. Again, if you're ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, please stop by and worship with us on Sundays at 9 and 10.30 a.m. If you'd like to find out more about the Sunshine Cathedral, about our resources, or about our books published by our senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Darrell Watkins, or if you'd like to make a donation to the Sunshine Cathedral, please visit us at www.sunshinecathedral.org. Until the next time, may God continue to richly bless you on your journey.